Hello, and thank you for attending today's webinar, Five Steps to Network Observability Nirvana. Before we dive into today's presentation, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. If you have a question at any point during the event, please submit via the chat window. We will address your questions throughout the conversation at the end of the presentation. Also, the recorded version of today's presentation will be available following the event. Please look for an email from the Kentic team to rewatch and share the presentation. Now, Christoph, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Angela. Hello, everyone, and welcome from the West Coast, where it's bright and early, not even day yet. Um, today, we'll talk about network observability and the five steps you can take to get to a good place. And you know, once the marketing team got their spin on it, it became Nirvana, which I can't promise. But what I can promise is that uh, you might learn a thing or two uh, today. So here's the lineup. Uh, my name is Christoph Bisper. I'm the Chief Product Officer here at Kentic. And with me here today are Anil Murthy, who is Director of Product Management, and uh, Dan Rohan, who is a Senior PM on the Kentic team. And while we all you look uh, young, <laughs> we have a few decades of experience around networks, and we all share a passion for what makes the internet and the digital economy go, which obviously networks are a big part of. And so today we want to make the case that um, today's networks are more complex, more diverse, uh, more closely tied to the apps and services that run over them and therefore more critical than ever. And as a result, need a new approach to managing them. And we call that approach network observability. And we'll explain exactly what we mean. And we'll show you some cool demos, not just slides. Uh, always, uh, you know, always better. And we'll also give you some hints on the steps you can take in your organizations to start the journey towards network observability. And uh, that's independently of where you are today in your um, maturity, I guess, um, as it relates to network management. But before we go into the content, uh, we want to learn a little bit more about you. And so you see a poll um, popping up here, hopefully, which um, is uh, about uh, characterizing your monitoring status, uh, meaning which answer you see on the slide here or the, on the, in the poll, um, you know, best reflect your current status. If you could take a minute. Cool. Uh, so pretty diverse um, uh, set of answers, but none of you seem to be satisfied with your current network management uh, solution, which is something, by the way, we hear a lot. Uh, you know, many, many folks out there are in process of rethinking their monitoring architectures, network monitoring architectures, and their solutions uh, they employ. So cool. Uh, I'll close the poll. And let's dive right in. So probably no surprise to uh, anybody here on this call that uh, more than before, uh, networks are complex. And that's with the big C. And why is that? Well, because most network teams uh, now have to deal with hybrid and cloud type uh, network architectures. And as your organizations, your companies deploy cloud containers, Kubernetes, service meshes, um, your infrastructure environments and networks become more complex and significantly so in some cases. Why is that? Because there's many more components, there are more places, and you don't, very importantly, have necessary management control uh, over them. Um, and also, today's networks are tied more tied to delivering the uh, apps and services that, well, you company, your companies provide to drive revenue. And that's because mostly today, new apps are SaaS, uh, software as a service. And by definition, that means that they're delivered over the internet, which some have called the new enterprise backbone network. And uh, as you guys all know, the internet is really not uh, a centrally controlled and slowly changed uh, traditional infrastructure. It's an interconnected web, you know, 60,000 ASNs, autonomous systems. And uh, it's, you know, mostly a best effort type uh, delivery. So long story short, uh, today's network's more complex, more critical, uh, you know, tied to uh, the app or service and therefore expected to be uh, flawless. Um, and that's why Gartner, as an example, says by 2024, which is not that far out, 50% uh, of network operations teams will be required to re-architect uh, their monitoring stack. And we agree with the assertion, but you know, how do you, how do you do that? What do you architect for? And so we believe 
that in order to deal with these challenges, uh, a new approach is needed. And the interesting thing is that the approach is already used in other layers of the stack. For example, today you'll be hard pressed to find a DevOps team that doesn't have an observability solution uh, deployed. And we believe that now is the time to bring the concept of observability to the network and apply some of these same principles that were tried and tested on the app and the compute uh, layers. Uh, but then what exactly is network observability? Uh, you know, some people say, hey, it's just a fancy new word for monitoring. Uh, you know, is it uh, just a different spin on the logs, metrics, traces definition that we know from uh, the DevOps uh, world. And we believe that absolutely not. Um, you know, so for us at its core, observability requires interactivity and open-ended exploration. And what does that mean? Well, it means collecting all the data, uh, all the telemetry about the network in particular and putting it into a big data lake. And then on top of that have a UI user interface allowing you to ask any sort of question about that uh, data. And you know some of the questions are here on uh, the slide. Um, is the network the problem? It's probably the most uh, common one. And often it's framed as, oh, you know, it must be the network uh, because my code is perfect and it can't be the app. Uh, but there's other very important questions like are we under DDoS attack? Uh, would, we, would it cost less if we uh, change the path of the traffic or with traffic egresses? Um, and so on. And the key really is, any question. So these are just examples, uh, but of course, you know, the range is uh, is very wide. Uh, and the reason, you know, any question is important that is because today the reality of it is that what we call the unknown problems, meaning the things that you couldn't see coming or instrument for, uh, meaning setting thresholds or stuff like that, is what you will see every day in these complex networks and infrastructures. And so the canned answers of the past you know, where you instrument a few devices and look at a few dashboards, uh, they're really not going to be able to uh, do the job. Um, looking at one last question on this uh, slide, you know, one that's being asked more and more is like, what's our cloud latency? And, uh, you know, why is that? Because uh, many applications today are not very tolerant of latency and even, you know, big companies like AWS acknowledge that now and put out more and more edge services like outposts or wavelengths or uh, so on. So latency is super important. And let me give you a specific example where it literally can make or break things. And so it's 2021, who would have believed? Um, and you know, robots, robots are real and online supermarkets are uh, real, believe it or not. And so there are these robots uh, zooming around a, a warehouse uh, to pack groceries into bins. And then uh, you know, these get put together into orders. And so they can pack an order of 50, 50 groceries in less than uh, five uh, minutes. And so in this warehouse, there are about a thousand robots working 70,000 orders uh, a week. And as you can imagine, these things move very fast. They zip around, uh, they cross paths. And of course, any course, any uh, kind of latency or packet loss in the system can create a big, huge mess. And so there's a critical need to observe this infrastructure, the bandwidth toward these warehouses, and of course, the overall performance of uh, the network. And you, know, you can't use your grandfather's network management solution for it because it doesn't handle the internet or anything outside a data center uh, really well. And so we think that this is a pretty cool use case. Can't tell you the name of the customer, but it's a real example of network observability uh, in action. So now that we've established that, hopefully established that it's needed, the uh, question is how does it look like and what does it uh, require? First of all, to observe, you have to see, and you have to see broadly. And you know what that means is that it's not enough to just see your on-prem network, you need visibility into the cloud, uh, especially if uh, your company is like many and has gonna, gone beyond one uh, VPC, virtual private cloud. Uh, you know, if you're using interconnects and transit gateways and so on, you need visibility uh, into these things. Um, second, you need broad, broad telemetry so, uh, support. So, you know, we all have grown up in this uh, world with, uh, with and around SNMP, but SNMP won't do the job alone. Uh, traffic and flow even won't do the job uh, alone. And then, uh, you know, streaming telemetry, which is increasingly popular, but, you know, that alone won't do the job uh, either. Um, 
and so you need all of these together. And by the way, uh, any type of agentry to collect the telemetry should, should be optional, but when needed, uh, should be available. And then finally, the last uh, box on this slide, context uh, or uh, enrichment. Um, so for example, what's the geolocation of uh, the network element? What's the metadata from the cloud or Kubernetes uh, environment I want to manage? And so you, know, you need context in addition to all the data because that what that's what makes the data meaningful uh, in terms of later on being able to uh, explore. And by the way, uh, there's also context in threat feeds, right? What uh, traffic is potentially malicious, more and more important uh, these days. And so the result of co combining all these things uh, that you see on the slide here uh, is a rich unified data set that enables um, asking all these questions and making timely informed decisions about your uh, network. And you know, how do you do that? Well. It's the second piece of uh, the puzzle. Um, you know, you drive. You drive what? You drive um, insights, right? And um, you have this overwhelming data set from the left. You know, what do you uh, do with it? And we think that proactive insights, which is basically you know rich statistical analysis and increasingly machine learning, um, you know, that will tell you, hey, you know, there's a traffic spike on interface X, and here's what's likely causing it, or uh, your traffic has shifted from peering to transit, and the cost has increased as a result. Um, it's so very important to get these insights um, out of the box, but not static, of course. And so, again, statistics, machine learning, super important. <clears throat> but then there's the next level uh, to that. Uh, you know, there's only so much insights can do. Um, you know, many of you are, you know, senior and uh, want to drive and dive around in the, the data. Um, and so, um, you know, using a concept like a data explorer, as an example, uh, to di dive into the data uh, based on the full granularity that you have available and doing this open-ended exploration is really, really uh, key. And then finally, you have to take action uh, oftentimes, right? And that can be as simple as creating a ticket in your favorite system or actively kick off a problem uh, resolution uh, workflow. And then finally, you know, everything has to be delivered in a form factor that is uh, real time, that scales to any size network, doesn't have any appliances, uh, if at all possible, and doesn't need you, excuse me, to uh, install, maintain, upgrade the software all the time, because that's, you know, not your core business, right? Uh, it should be a managed uh, service. And so how does this look in a bit more detail? Um, and as an example, let's look at the Kentic Network Observability Cloud. And so first, there's a platform for all the enrichment and the storage. And again, we're talking huge data sets, uh, you know, in the trillions of uh, records, uh, not millions, not billions, but trillions of records. Uh, where all that uh, takes place, of course, the analytics, uh, API access, uh, all of that. And by the way, the idea should be to allow you to do anything that you can do with the UI via an API, because that enables a key requirement that many of you have, which is to integrate um, your observability solution into a tool chain. So you know, there's no one tool that does it all, and so it needs to be integrated, and uh, APIs are key uh, to that. And so then the platform ingests, correlates, and that adds context to uh, these telemetry sources we talked about, you know, the flow logs. Now you know what these icons mean. Uh, flow logs, um, you know, including the VPC flow logs from the cloud, streaming telemetry, uh, host metrics, SNP, synthetics, and uh, so on. Uh, but then importantly, you know, you typically don't buy a platform, right? You buy products that uh, solve problems. And that's why we allow to consume Kentic as a suite, but also as distinct uh, products, not consuming everything at once. And so the, problem, the products uh, solve problems and facilitate uh, use cases. For example, our core product uh, allows for troubleshooting, capacity planning of uh, core networks, data center, uh, van, SD-WAN, and, and so on. Another example is uh, synthetics, uh, which we'll see here in uh, a demo in a minute. So, you know, all of a sudden you add synthetics and you manage the digital experience, SaaS performance of applications. Uh, and by the way, the correlation of traffic and synthetic data sources is super uh, powerful, and we'll show, you, uh, sh show that to you in a, in a minute. And then a third example here, and this is not, uh, you know, 
an exhaustive list of use cases, of course. Uh, you know, you add the cloud module that we got and you look into your on-prem to AWS or uh, on-prem to GCP traffic, <clears throat> the performance and the cost of this uh, traffic. And then finally, uh, you know, all of these products seamlessly integrate because they're built on the same foundation and platform at uh, the bottom there. Um, and you know you see some of these use cases at the top again it's not an exhaustive list um, you know ddos mitigation detection and mitigation is an important one and that's provided by our protect module um, and hopefully this gives you a taste of what network observability is and can be but for now let's um, stop with the slide work for a bit and want to show you for real what this stuff can do for uh, you your team and your uh, business and for that we've prepared uh, two demos First one is delivered by Anil, and uh, that will show you how autonomous and continuous testing can be a big advantage in today's networks. And then the second demo is delivered by Dan, and we'll show you to how to troubleshoot an AWS outage uh, and take quick action. And I think it's timely because <clears throat> you probably all have heard that, uh, well, it was for the US, but AWS had an outage before uh, Thanksgiving holiday, so not too long ago, and that had pretty widespread implications. Um, but with that, Anil, over to you. Thank you, Christoph. All right, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, you should be seeing it now. Let me know if you don't. Yep. yep. Yeah. All right, thank you. So, all right. So, um, for those of you that are on the call that have seen the Kentic platform, this page should look pretty familiar. But uh, if you haven't seen this before, this is basically a kind of our main landing page of our platform. Um, it's what we refer to as the Network Explorer. And most of the data that you see here is coming from real traffic. Um, the, the focus of my demo today, though, is a small portion of our entire uh, portfolio products, as Christoph mentioned. So that is the synthetic portion, and that's up here. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump into that. So as Christoph mentioned, synthetics is not just a uh, part of our entire uh, network observability platform, but it's also a product module within our, within our overall product suite. Um, and so you're looking at that right now. Uh, what you're seeing here on this page is um, all the alerts that are generated by the various synthetic tests that are running within, within this account. Um, and uh, you know, from here, you can sort of get a quick bird's eye view of how um, your overall system is performing. Um, we also have you know, free SaaS application monitoring for you. Um, so if you have common SaaS applications that your um, employees or um, you know, customers use that you want to monitor performance towards, you can do that uh, for free. And then uh, if at any point you want to, you're curious about how the various clouds are performing, um, you can jump into our cloud performance uh, tab here, and this will show you the performance of all the major cloud providers um, by testing various availability zones between these cloud, cloud regions. Um, and so you get a quick bird's eye view of how things are performing on any given day or any given time. Um, there's a lot more I can talk about, but uh, for the sake of keeping this short, I'm going to jump right into the focus of what I'm going to present today, which is you know how can take leverages um, flow data to not just bring greater visibility into your synthetic monitoring solution, but also to ease the burden of set up, setting up and maintaining uh, tests. Um, so this here is our what we refer to as add test page, and so this this is kind of a listing of all the types of tests that we offer within synthetic monitoring today. So you'll see here that we obviously offer the most um, simplest of tests, which is you know your user defined tests where you have a specific IP address or a host name um, in mind, and you want to test performance towards it. Um, we also offer testing at the web layers, so you can test performance towards HTTP servers or um, towards specific DNS servers. Um, so that's pretty much uh, you know, the kinds of things that you would expect to see in, in a synthetic monitoring solution. Uh, but what differentiates us, or one of the things that differentiates us from the rest of the solutions that you might see out there is the idea of autonomous testing. Um, so, so how does this work and how did it come about? So the way this came about was as we were building our synthetic monitoring solution, um, we talk to a lot of our customers, and keep in mind that we've been doing, um, you know, flow analytics uh, as a company for a long time. And so, when we talk to all of our customers that were using our flow product, um, the most obvious sort of differentiator for us was to bring in um, active monitoring data alongside um, real flow data, right? 
Now we said, you know, that's cool, but we can go a step further and not just show you the data, but also use the fact that we can look at the data to make your life easy in setting up these tests. Um, and so that's how these autonomous tests came about. And so the way these work is rather than having a specific um, IP address or a host name in mind, what you need here is just an intent to test performance towards a specific entity. Um, and this entity might be an ASN or a network. It might be a, um, a CDN, a country, a region, or a city. And then let's say um, you want to test performance towards a given ASN. Um, what we can do as a uh, platform is we can peer into your network traffic and we can say, hey, based on looking at the flow data that, that's coming in to our platform, these are all the ASNs that we see you sending traffic from your sites. Um, so this is a listing of all the ASNs in this particular um, customer or this particular demo account. Um, and it's sorted by the amount of traffic going towards each of, each of these ASNs. So what, it, what we've done here is said, um, let's take all the traffic that's going from your sites and narrow it down to the ones that have the most amount of data going. So let's focus on the ones that matter the most. Um, so now once you've run this um, query, you can now say, okay, um, now that I know that Google's getting a lot of traffic from me, I'm going to go ahead and click on select over there. And then now what's going to happen is we're going to run another query and we're going to say, now that you said you want to test performance towards the Google ASN, um, I'm going to find all the sites that have traffic going towards that particular ASN. So here's the various sites that have traffic. And in each of these cases, if you happen to have a synthetic agent installed, um, we will give you the option of um, potentially adding that agent um, in, in your tests. So in this case, this particular site happens to have an agent here. So I'm going to go ahead and click on add. And so what's going to happen now is we are going to run um, analytics and queries on, on this data and um, find for you specific IP addresses within this ASN automatically. So rather than you having to go and find these IP addresses and set up tests individually, um, we'll go ahead and do that for you automatically. Um, and we'll give you the option of repeating the same query every so often. So by default, we'll repeat this query every 12 hours. And if we happen to find any new IP addresses within at target ASN, we'll go ahead and create tests towards those as well. Some of the other things that you can do here, um, apart from, from the option to specify the repeat query, is you can select the test frequency. Um, and we're super proud of the fact that we are one of the, probably the only platform out there that is able to test not just at every minute, but even sub-minute uh, frequencies, so all the way down to every second. Um, so as Christoph mentioned, you may, may recall from the slides previously, um, some of our customers have very demanding applications that are extremely sensitive to latency, um, like the robotic application that Christoph was talking about, uh, and they find uh, the ability to test every second extremely valuable. Um, so that's just a general um, you know, sense for how an ASN test gets set up. And so the overall idea here is rather than you having to set up and maintain these tests, we'll do that for you automatically. Let's jump over and see how the data get, then gets presented out of these tests. So I'm going to go ahead and into the test control center, which is um, a listing of all the tests that are configured in the system um, at any given point of time. And I'm going to filter down to a specific test type, in this case, an ASN test. Um, so these are all the ASN tests that are in this um, particular account. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and pick the um, uh, Equinix ASN test here. And so it has six agents that are used in this test. Um, and for the sake of explaining again what this test is, I'm going to hit edit here. So you can see that we're testing performance towards the Equinix ASN from a bunch of different locations where there are agents installed. And we're telling uh, the platform to repeat this query every 12 hours. Um, so the way this gets presented is, for each of the locations where you're testing from, um, we are going to go ahead and run a query to find specific IP addresses that have um, traffic coming towards them within the target ASN, which is the Equinix ASN in this case. So that's how, this is how the data gets presented. And so here you can see that um, here are each of the locations. And for each of the locations, there are IP addresses um, that we're testing um, you know, network performance towards every single minute. Uh, and keep in mind that I didn't have to specify any of these IP addresses. They were all created automatically for me. Um, now from here, what I can do is I can hover over the timeline here and find points in the timeline where the overall test uh, wasn't performing so well. And so this is an example of that. And then from here, I can, uh, I can sort of go down and I can see not just the 
the metrics like latency, jitter, and packet loss um, represented here, but also the actual real traffic that would be impacted as a result of this uh, test failing, right? Um, and then while I can see that traffic information, I can also see information about the connectivity type and the provider. Um, so this is extremely valuable information because not only is it um, giving you the metrics that you care about uh, from a synthetic testing standpoint, but it's also putting it in the context of you know real world traffic and the impact to your customers. And then from here, you can not just stop here, but you can go further and say, okay, now show me more details about this, like which specific uh, metric was spiking and how much was it spiking on. And so when I click on details here, uh, what you'll see is a, a set of time series charts that'll show me a specific spike that uh, that's causing the, the, the test to fail this particular instance. And then of course, alongside, you can also see the real traffic right there. Um, going back here, the last thing I'll show, uh, show you on this particular view is um, if you were debugging one of these situations where you're trying to find the root cause, mm -hmm. I'll click through uh, to the path view, and that will show you a complete representation of the traffic that's flowing uh, through this entire system. Um, so that's just a quick snapshot of uh, our synthetic monitoring solution here. <clears throat> There's a lot more I can talk about, but um, being cognizant of time, I'm going to go ahead and uh, ask Dan to take over. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, today, I'm going to show you how you can use the network observability techniques that Christoph introduced uh, to troubleshoot a cloud outage. So as Christoph mentioned, uh, AWS had a pretty major outage, it took out a large portion of the internet shortly before uh, the 25th of November, Thanksgiving in the US. And this left a lot of people really scrambling to understand how this impacted their organizations and figure out what they needed to do in order to restore their operations. So let me show you how our demo customer call it Acme Inc, used our product to get a handle um, on this outage and move their organizations towards you know, mitigation. So as a bit of an introduction here, Acme operates hybrid infrastructure and multiple clouds. Uh, they've got two physical data centers with branch offices you know, around the world. And just like many of you who are impacted by this event, uh, Acme's SRE and DevOps teams reached out to the NetOps teams to kind of help them understand what the impact of this event was on their customers to help them get back up and running. Um, and this is a really common pattern because, you know, as, as CP mentioned earlier on, uh, you know, a lot of these DevOps teams, their tools really consist of logs, metrics, and traces um, to, to, you know, describe their, their applications uh, particularly. But um, they often don't have tools that can look at the big picture of their infrastructure like we're going to show you here today. So let's go into the Kentic map to dive in a little bit. And I'll, I'll show you around. So coming into that map, uh, on the upper left-hand corner, we've got our clouds. And so these are the, the clouds that Acme actually operates in. Um, and are, they're sending the flow logs and metrics from these clouds off to Kentuck. And then over on the right, we've got our internet block. And so this is the source and the destination ASNs, uh, the providers, the next hops that this traffic is flowing through. And then below that, we've got our on-prem network, including the data centers and the offices that Acme operates. You know, and, and as an aside here, we can click on anything that's red and take a look at the health, which we determine from the SNMP that we pull in each of these locations. And between all of these blocks, we've got bi-directional traffic details. So you can always have a really big picture of, uh, you know, how traffic is flowing in your hybrid environment. Anything on the map that you see, you can click on. Um, so, for example, here, if I click on AWS, uh, this will bring up our current traffic data for this profile. Um, but, of course, you know, when we look into these kinds of events, we have to go back in time. And so I'll go ahead and change this time window here uh, and move our look back uh, to the 25th, let's say, at 11 a.m. And, and end our query window on the 26th at 2 a.m. So hitting apply here and then clicking again on Amazon, we can clearly see that dip in traffic that represents the, the overall impact that this outage had on our environment. And seeing everything is great and this map here helps a lot with that kind of thing, but uh, you know, that's often just the beginning. And Kentix Data Explorer was really built to enable this concept of network observability. You know, it, it provides you with the ability to just ask anything you want about your network. Um, you know, as you interact with your data and follow the, the threads of your network investigation. So let's check that out next. 
So I'll go ahead and click into the Data Explorer. And when we click in view in the Data Explorer, this brings up the same chart we left off with in the hybrid map, but it also provides us with this complete toolkit uh, that allows us to go as deep as we want to or need to in order to answer some of these network observability questions. So to illustrate this, let's kind of dig deeper, you know, and see how ACME would have done uh, some of these queries to impact or to understand this impact. So the first thing that they would probably need to do is understand what kind of traffic was impacted. Was it internal? Was it external? Was it their multi-cloud control plane traffic? And we can you know, show this easily by adding our traffic profile dimension to the query. So hitting save automatically reruns the query. Okay, and so looking at this graph, we can start to see that story unfold. You know, prior to the incident, uh, you know, we can see that the vast majority of our AWS traffic was actually internal. And then closely following this, we can also see that the from cloud to outside profile, meaning the traffic that originated in the cloud and went out to the internet, uh, you know, was impacted. That doesn't include the, the on-prem network, by the way. And as this incident unfolds, we can see this moderate decrease in traffic from, you know, 12 to 1400 hours where just uh, a fraction of the traffic is left uh, from what it was previously. But we can also see that some traffic profiles basically remained unchanged. And, and we can dig into this a little bit better visually if we change the visualization and, and mute some of the first few data series. So let me show you how you do that. Up here, I can choose a number of different visualizations. And one of my favorites is always the line chart because it kind of gets rid of all of the, uh, the stacked uh, data series. And I can then interact with the, the graph a little bit by removing the historical lines, the total lines. And then even removing some of these top series to get into some of the bottom end of our query. Um, and so this begins to help us draw some conclusions. You know, we can see that some parts of our cloud were really basically unaffected, while others were really deeply impacted. And so we can continue our investigation with the data explorer by figuring out what they actually were. So let's use a neat feature of the data explorer to dig in a bit here. And this feature is called uh, uh, generate one chart per series. In order to do this, we'll also go ahead and choose a new dimension. We'll change traffic profile to region because we want to take a look at which source regions were impacted by this event. And then we choose for every region that we see that same traffic profile. So as I mentioned, this feature, it enumerates for every region we see, whatever dimension we want to run that uh, query by and sort of auto-generates a dashboard. And so for this uh, dashboard, we can start to take a look here. We can see that in US East 1, we see that uh, the bulk majority of our traffic was running prior to the incident. And we can also see that most of this traffic was internal with workloads uh, uh, to a small amount of the customer traffic outbound. And below this, we've got our AWS traffic that's not represented by regions at all. And so this is the services that are globally available in AWS. Think, you know, S3, IAM, CloudFront, server certificates, et cetera. And we can see that there was definitely an impact on this, even though this wasn't necessarily uh, associated with the region. And, and, you know, if you had read into this incident, uh, uh, one of the things that we all learned from this is that a lot of these supposedly global regions are actually run out of, of US East 1, or at least they were at the time of this incident. And then we can see our backup region, US East 2 here, that seems completely unaffected um, you know, by this outage. So this starts to tell a crisper story of the outage. We now know which region is affected, which regions are stable, but let's go ahead and dig further to see you know, which portions of our infrastructure were impacted and, and which you know, customers were impacted. So scrolling back up to US East 1, we can click on the graph here to refocus our experience just around this particular region. So let's drill into this cloud internal uh, series of data and, and see what VPCs and instances are infected. And so what I can do here is actually say, for this series, I wanna show this series by, and then I'm gonna choose VPC. So I'm gonna say, show me my source and destination VPCs inside US East 1 that are speaking internal. Okay. So now I can see it's, you know, uh, this particular VPC ending in E7A talking to itself. Um, and so this is really important. Uh, but let's go ahead and 
go a little deeper here and find out what, what VMs and applications are present here. So I can do the same sort of pattern, show by, and say, show me with instance, uh, the instance name, source and best instance name, and also let's show the application. Maybe that will help us paint a nice picture for our, our application teams that are waiting for our answers here. Okay, so really quickly, we can now see that this is definitely our Kubernetes cluster. We've got the Kubernetes nodes talking to themselves. We can also see you know, which exact applications uh, that these nodes are using um, so that we can start to dig in a little deeper. So if we go back, um, we can take another look here. Um, and let's go back one more. All right. So if we modify our query here and choose that we want to see the US East 2 region, we can clearly see that you know, none of those traffic profiles were impacted at all. And so this paints a really clear picture for us that we can start to communicate to our teams. So we can come up here into our, our actions and we can export this chart however we'd like. We can share the view via URL to our colleagues. Uh, we can create a save view or add it to a dashboard. And we can start to you know, help our teams get back up and running. You know, and the last thing I'll say is I come back over here to the map if we dig into one of these data centers here, so let's just choose uh, SFO, SJC, DFW1. Didn't want to leave you seeing how, without an opportunity to see how we visualize your on-prem infrastructure. If we chose to move some of these affected applications back to our on-prem data center and we start to see this data center light up, all of these nodes uh, that represent our CLO infrastructure will start to increase in real time, and we can, uh, you know, watch this traffic, um, you know, begin to be served out of these environments out to the internet. Okay, and I think with that, I'll pass this back over to Christoph. Yeah, cool. So this was uh, amazing. I think. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Anil. I hope you've seen how. Uh, these concept, uh, concepts of, uh, you know, using all the data, uh, all the telemetry, you know, correlating this stuff and then allowing this open-ended exploration, uh, basically drilling into, uh, you know, the details uh, as you would like uh, to do it and having the whole granularity and having it, you know, almost like a time machine going back in time to uh, November, um, you know, which... Uh, has been some time ago and and looking at the full granularity of what has been going on is pretty uh, amazing uh, and so you know real tangible value we think but to drive home that point let me give you some uh, real hard data from our existing uh, customers and so back in i think uh, the fall we uh, surveyed a big number uh, of them uh, about 120 to be exact, and here's what uh, they told us. Uh, so uh, over half of them uh, get better uptime uh, using uh, network observability. Um, you know, 64% get their mean time uh, to innocence or mean time to repair uh, down, uh, which is a big benefit for uh, network operations teams. And then uh, quite a few see uh, operations OPEX uh, costs uh, decreases. Uh, so that's, you know, how you sell this to uh, your uh, manager. But, you know, this is kind of, you know, data. Um, this is numbers. But, you know, what's also, I think, very telling is uh, the companies that use Kentic for network observability across their organizations with, you know, use cases like troubleshooting, capacity planning, uh, what you've seen today, um, you know, they... Uh, they are super happy, uh, and I'll let you read these comments for uh, yourself. But you know, we're very proud to be able to partner with companies uh, like this, including Zoom, who has become sort of the you know go-to for all of us, at least in the U.S., as we work from uh, home. Uh, and we're helping Zoom to uh, make sure everybody's work experiences are as good as they can be during this time. And calls like this uh, go off um, pretty much uh, seamlessly and knocking on wood that it'll continue. <laughs> All right, so um, let's talk a little bit about the uh, the five steps um, to reach this good place that some of these you know best companies in the world, the digital natives 
have uh, gotten pretty uh, close to. And the first step is what we call binary monitoring. And most of you are probably already doing that today. There's not many companies who don't have some sort of network uh, monitoring. And back uh, in the day when I started in this business, a long time ago, in the glory days of uh, the granddaddy of network management software, which was called HP OpenView, uh, you know, this was the gold standard, right? Interface up, interface down, and uh, showing it on a nice map. So that's, you know, kind of step one of the maturity uh, curve. But then uh, the industry, we, we started to add some telemetry, right? Some SNMP, metrics encounters, um, you know, which added value, but of course, all very device-centric, uh, big picture, totally missing here. And you're not uh, looking beyond your on-prem uh, network at all uh, towards the cloud or uh, the internet. And, you know, we've seen the value that that can provide in Dan's uh, demo. And so the third step is probably where most of the industry uh, is today. There's monitoring of devices, there's instrumentation of these elements, there's some flow, some traffic, maybe even some synthetics uh, here and there, although that's, you know, still uh, not as common. But uh, you know, all of these telemetry sources are very scattered. Uh, there's no way of using traffic to direct your synthetics, as uh, Anil has uh, shown, or there is no correlation between these telemetry sources into higher level insights, as uh, as Dan has shown. And you know, hopefully, you uh, got from the demos that that is really important uh, if you really want to figure out what's going on and uh, improve your troubleshooting, improve your insights into uh, your network and be a good partner to your uh, DevOps teams. And so step four is where you bring some of these things together in a comprehensive uh, way. And there are really not too many examples out there in terms of tooling that would allow you to uh, do this in the networking space. Again, um, you know, there's possibly a, a product in Germany that, uh, you know, may come close to this, but they all you know, whatever's out there um, that may come close to this, what they all lack is what really defines observability in our view, which is the ability to explore beyond these dashboards, uh, to look into the un unknown unknown. And of course, um, you know, oftentimes a complete lack of API to integrate or orchestrate uh, the systems from uh, the outside. And also they're mostly on-prem uh, type models. And so that's you know what you look for in uh, step five, uh, observable. Uh, it's correlated and enriched telemetry in a single view, uh, ability to ask any question, guide it or uh, unbound it through a concept like the data explorer, uh, advanced workflows, learning, reporting, APIs, and of course, AI-based uh, insights. And so all of this should be delivered in a SaaS form factor. So you and your company don't have to worry about uh, installing, upgrading, maintaining uh, the system, which is always a big, big uh, tax. And so then really the only uh, decision you have to make is whether you build this or buy it because it can be built uh, today. There's you know, a lot of open source tooling <clears throat> that you can uh, you know, clobber together. Um, and by the way, Kentic is a major contributor and will be a major contributor to this type of uh, ecosystem as we uh, you know, roll out components that help with uh, companies uh, who, who wanna build it. But if you build it, you have to maintain it, right? And so that's back to the previous uh, point. Um, and you know, uh, that is a choice that uh, you have and you can make. And you know, it depends on your company's appetite to basically uh, you know, build and maintain this type of uh, system. So that's sort of the, the five uh, steps. Hopefully I gave you some pointers in terms of what exactly uh, you have to think about. And, um, you know, what's the net net of what we uh, covered today? Back in the day, we used to call this uh, conclusion, but nowadays it's the TLDR, which does sound much cooler. Um, so first of all, network professionals like yourself you need observability principles, tools, platforms uh, to not just uh, practicing observability uh, at the compute and application layer, but really uh, doing it at the, the network. Uh, because we've seen that today's networks need to work flawlessly. Um, we think that observability leads to better performance, uh, reliability, security, uh, remediation, and also uh, growth. 
uh, we hopefully have made the case that you know the legacy tooling out there is probably not good enough for this modern infrastructure for uh, you know the cloud pieces that nowadays are often times involved uh, look at the internet and then of course um, you know some of you may have looked at your DevOps tooling um, and you know while some claim that uh, they have network as being part of their solution it usually stops at uh, eth zero meaning they have gaps in understanding how uh, you know network primitives uh, get involved like overlay underlays uh, you know the workflows that you guys uh, want from a network management standpoint uh, and so you know typically we've seen that these devops tools fall short for what uh, you have to do on uh, on the network and then finally if you follow some of the principles uh, we discussed here today, you can get there and you can get there whether you build it or buy it and keep in mind that Kentic can help you in uh, either case. So we're uh, here as a resource wherever you are in your uh, observability uh, journey. And so with that, we have uh, 10 minutes left, well-timed. We have one additional uh, poll if you wanna bring that up, uh, Angela. Yeah, the needle in the health haystack. We uh, we hear that a lot, um, and you know it's really a needle in a haystack uh, or in a you know a bunch of haystacks in the middle of a hurricane. I mean that's what it sometimes uh, feels like. Uh, and you know you're not alone if you have that issue. And you know really we think that only tools like we've discussed, tooling that we've discussed today, uh, that allows you to you know. Um, ask these questions, these open-ended questions, um, you know, is able to help with this uh, problem. So, you know, I think uh, we're pretty well uh, aligned here. And with that, if everybody's okay, we can open it up for some questions. The first one is, how do you come up with the automated tests? Yeah, I can. Absolutely. And Anil, if you want to, you know, just recap what you've shown basically, yeah. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, it's um, the way we do that is basically um, given that we're a flow platform first, and we are able to ingest all this flow, real flow data. We can peer inside the flow data and find specific IP addresses uh, based on where you are located on the internet, right? So once we do that, we can go ahead and create the test automatically for you. Okay, great. Um, so the next question is: Do you support traffic from Kubernetes environment? Uh, the answer is. Uh, yes, we have some uh, instrumentation uh, today, and uh, that's actually an area of, uh, you know, big, big focus uh, for us because these Kubernetes environments are uh, basically networks in and of uh, themselves. And so being able to understand them, uh, map them, and figure out what's going on is uh, a big, big uh, focus area uh, for us. We've not shown that level of detail uh, today, but we, uh, we do have it. Okay, great. And then one last question. Um, when you say enriched data, um, can you give some examples of data and what they would, can do for me? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, oftentimes it's not enough to just understand that there's an IP address that's involved in, you know, some issue that, uh, that you face. Uh, you want to know you know, what that IP address is. Is it, a, is it a host? Is it a router? Is it, you know, some other uh, thing? What does it run? Uh, and, you know, where is it located? Uh, so, you know, being able to uh, map geography to uh, into the picture as additional uh, context is, uh, is super important. And so these are just some, you know, easy examples uh, in terms of uh, the enrichment that we do. We mentioned uh, thread feeds uh, as another uh, very key uh, you know, point for our security-minded uh, customers. If you want to do DDoS uh, detection and mitigation, that's obviously super, uh, super important. And maybe Dan has a couple uh, more. Uh, I don't want to put him on the spot, but... Well, I mean, one of the things that I always think of is when the customer brings their own. So sometimes people segment their data centers into pods and they want to see pod to pod traffic or they have their own custom applications that they want to tag traffic by. So it's not just HTTP, but it's, you know, the specific name of the app, for example. Okay. Cool, Andrew, any other uh, questions here? No, that's all we have 
for right now. So um, if you have any additional questions, just make sure to email us. You can email us at info at kentig.com with any additional questions. Well, so, uh, you know, let me add my uh, thanks to uh, all of you guys for spending an hour here with us. Hopefully, uh, you know, you get some insights. I always find these demos to be super cool and instead of just looking at slides and Thanks, uh, Anil and Dan, for doing an amazing job. And thanks, uh, Angela, for organizing this for us. Goodbye. <laughs>